Join our free WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. Part 1 You will hear two students, Jack and Amy, discussing the details of the concerts that they are planning to hold. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Oh, hi, Jack. Thank you for coming to discuss the details of the concert. It's a real help. No problem, Amy. I'm looking forward to throwing some ideas around. Shall we order coffee before we begin? Yes, I'll have a cappuccino, please. Right. First on the agenda is deciding who the intended audience is, because we'll obviously have to base our choice of music on this. Classical concerts are held all the time, but I'd really like to do something different and make it special. What do you think about holding it outside? I like the idea, but the weather is too unpredictable. What if we host the concert for children? We could make it more lighthearted, and everyone could dress up in costume. What a wonderful idea! We could host the event every afternoon so that children can attend after school. How much do you think we should charge? I don't think we should charge more than $5 for the student tickets. No, I think that $4 would be a fair price. We can charge adults a little bit more. I'd say that $6.50 is suitable. OK, great! That should hopefully cover the costs of running the event. The local press will be in attendance to take photographs to print in the newspaper, so we'll also need to organize a press tent. It's all so exciting! There will also be a representative from the local radio station broadcasting live. They're predicting that over a thousand people will tune in to listen. Now that we're agreed, let's move on to discuss our other more sophisticated concert where we'll be hosting a number of well-known opera performers. As the majority of people will be at work during the day, I suggest that the concert takes place in the late afternoon or evening, which is do you think? I think we should definitely hold an evening concert. The darkness will make the entire performance more dramatic. Yes, that will be fantastic. Let's host the event on Friday when everyone can wind down after finishing a week of work. It'll be a lovely start to the weekend. As it will be a lavish and elegant event, I think we should set quite a high entrance fee of around $40. It'll give us some extra money to spend on decorations. That sounds fair. Instead of using chandeliers and electric lights, we should decorate the marquee with candles instead. It will be so romantic. OK, perfect. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, moving on to the concert where we showcase talented opera singers from the local area. Perhaps we should host this opera show on Monday evening? I think that the venue is already booked on Monday, but Tuesday will do nicely. How much do you think we should charge the audience for tickets? Since the performers are not professionals, perhaps we should make this a free event. Yes, tickets will be free, but we should ask everyone for a donation so that we can cover the costs of the venue and food and drink. The venue also comes complete with a piano, so hopefully one of the performers will be able to play. 
I had lessons when I was younger, but I'm not accomplished enough to perform in front of an audience. Well, what if we make our final concert a karaoke night where everyone of any ability can sing on stage? It could be really good fun, and it would give everyone the opportunity to join in. Yes, I love that idea. Let's hold it during the day on Saturday so that everyone, including families and the elderly, can attend. Perhaps we should offer concessions for students, children, and the elderly to make the tickets more affordable and encourage everyone to come. Yes, definitely. I think that the majority of the crowd will be composed of families and friendship groups, so we should avoid giving a group discount to maximize the income from ticket sales. Let's arrange a secret surprise to end the show on a high for everyone. How about a band performance? One of my friends happens to know a famous singer who I'm sure would be happy to perform for a small fee. Oh wow, that sounds brilliant! Well, I think we've addressed the details for all of the concerts. Thank you so much for helping. See you later. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio program giving some advice about saving energy. First, you'll have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for tuning in to Action Radio, where we discuss current affairs and global issues. My name is Jill, and today I'll be discussing the very relevant issue of the importance of saving water and how you can do this at home. The most common type of wasted energy in the domestic environment is heat. However, since the walls of my home are very well insulated, I am lucky to have no issue with this. I've discovered, however, that I waste a lot of water as a result of my lifestyle. I've researched ways to minimize my water usage online and have been pleasantly surprised to find that there are specialists in the area who can make some changes to my home immediately. The only downside is that the works are quite expensive and there are no means of getting financial assistance. Now, if any of you listeners are interested in reducing your energy usage, here are a couple of easy and positive changes you can make immediately. A lot of the magazines will recommend that you change your bulbs for those with energy-saving capabilities. However, I have found that these make little difference to your electricity bills and they also severely reduce the light levels in your home. Instead, simply switch off all plug sockets and appliances to make an immediate saving on your electricity consumption. If this doesn't make enough of a saving for you, you could later try turning down the thermostat as well. Despite the discount that my energy provider gave me for prompt payment, my monthly bills were very expensive for the amount of energy that I was using, so I decided to change providers. Not only did I make a huge monthly saving, but the company also offered me other perks. 
I am now able to pay my monthly bills online, for example, which I am thrilled about because it means that I no longer have to drive to the bank. Once I have been a customer with them for a year, they will also offer a deduction for all of the energy saving appliances I use. Now, many of you will have an electricity meter at home, so I'm sure you'll all understand the issues associated with them. They occupy a lot of space in your home and can be unsightly if you're unable to tuck them away in a cupboard. Mine is quite large as it measures both my gas and electricity, but I was luckily able to hide it in the coat cupboard where I can keep it hidden but also access it easily. Having said that, whenever I have to take a meter reading, I have to use a torch because the screen is too dark to read the numbers correctly. I have recently had an extension built on my house to make room for a new bathroom complete with a low energy boiler so I can take long showers guilt free. The walls are nice and thick and well insulated, but unfortunately, the window is a little drafty, so I'm going to have to invest in upgrading it. Speaking of renewable energy, I initially considered installing solar panels on the roof instead of using a low energy boiler, which was the less expensive option. In the end, I decided that the panels would look too ugly on my house, despite that they were technically easy to operate. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, if you're a fan of taking long showers like I am, then switching from baths to showers will not help to reduce your water usage. Instead, here are some small but effective changes you can make. When making a cup of tea, for example, measure out the amount of water that you need before boiling it. And when brushing your teeth, use a cup of water instead of a running tap. I tried filling up my washing machine before switching it on, but I found that the clothes were not thoroughly cleaned, so I would not recommend this. If your tap drips when it is turned off, then you should call a plumber to fix it as this can result in a lot of water being wasted. Before finishing today's show, I'd like to address two questions that we often get asked by listeners. We had some great feedback about our answer to last week's question on how to calculate the price involved in powering domestic appliances, so let's see how we do this week. One of our most commonly asked questions this week was which device is the lowest energy option for watching films? The simplest answer is that the smaller the screen, the lower the energy used. One of our listeners wrote in with a question that made me chuckle, and the answer is yes, solar panels only work when the sun is out. Now, on a more serious note, a number of you wanted to know what the most efficient temperature is to set the thermostat to. The answer is that the closer you set it to room temperature, the lower the energy used. Before I say goodbye until next week, I'll leave you with one last tip. Turn off the lights when you leave the room. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear Tim and Jenny, two students, talking about their geography assessment. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? I'm OK, but I'm really stressed out about our geography assessment next week. Have you done any work on it yet? I've looked at it a little bit, but it would be helpful to discuss it with someone else. Do you want to chat about it with me? That would be great. Do you know what the rules are for the test? For our assessment last term, we were all required to collect raw data in order to achieve a pass. However, this term the tutor has said that it won't be necessary for us to do this. I read through the notes and they said that we are all going to be given a set of instructions that we can choose to follow if we wish, but it's not mandatory and we can complete the exam as we wish. I don't think that the rules will be too strict. As long as we don't copy the answers from anyone else's exam paper, I think we'll be sure to pass. Yes, I agree. Shall we put together a slideshow presentation with information on all of the volcanoes? I think it will really help us to revise the facts. OK, great. Let's start with Pompeii. It's the most well-known of all the volcanoes, so it should be easy to find lots of information about it online. I'll avoid including some of the images in the presentation, as many people were killed, and some of them can be quite disturbing. We're lucky to have a double free period today, so we will have plenty of time to revise this together. OK, next up is Mount Fago. This is an ancient mythical volcano, the location of which is unclear. There are mountainous regions in both Mexico and the USA, both of which are rumored to be the site of this volcano. It's not very scientific to list two separate locations for one volcano, but since no one has been able to prove which is the correct one, we're left with no choice. It's interesting that there is no other example of a volcano in existence today that is surrounded by so much mystery. Absolutely. I think we should include some information about Mount Etna in Sicily, which is famous for the stunning panoramas that one can appreciate from its peak. According to Google, it's a relatively new volcano compared to others in the surrounding region, which may be why it has very few of the features found in older volcanoes. Oh, how interesting. Shall we include information on Mount Hurton? I don't think that any of the other students have carried out much research into it, even though it has a lot of unique features. I think we should leave it out. Since it's a man-made volcano, it's not that relevant to our syllabus and probably won't be included in any of the exam questions. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Have you gotten feedback from your tutor on your presentation last week? Yes, I have, but I don't think he was very impressed. He was satisfied by the amount of research that I had prepared before I started, but he criticized the fact that I was mostly summarizing the facts instead of giving my own opinion. Oh, that's a shame. It was frustrating that he criticized my work, but in the end, I learned a lot from my tutor's feedback. He advised me that next time I should present my work as a short documentary film, which he thinks will help me to strengthen my arguments. What topic was your presentation based on? 
I chose to write about the lack of knowledge that most people have about volcanoes, and the fact that they see them in such a negative way. During documentaries and lectures, the scientific experts often neglect to mention the many positive features that volcanoes possess. That sounds really interesting. Well done. I think everyone enjoyed watching, but I was really nervous about talking in front of an audience. I also felt very underprepared, since I didn't finish writing the presentation until the night before, and therefore had no time to rehearse it. I'm sure it was great. Is there any other information that you think we should include in our slideshow for revision? Yes, I think it's important that we list all of the differences between active and extinct volcanoes, as there will definitely be a question on this topic. There are no documentaries on the subject, but there's a very informative website that discusses the geological structure of each volcano type. Okay, well, I'll continue collecting images, and you can carry on with the online research. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture in a series of lectures about chain stores in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the second lecture in our series on chain stores in the UK. Today, I will be focusing on a very successful global petrol company called Telsa, paying particular attention to their expansion and future development. There will be time for questions at the end. So please refrain from interrupting during the talk. When it was founded, the company was a family-run organization with only one shop open in a small town in southern England. The family was able to compete with other local companies by offering special discounts for returning customers, which resulted in a huge expansion of their client base. This strategy was so successful. That they were able to open petrol stations across the country, subsequently increasing their market share in England. Within a decade, Telsa were running establishments throughout the UK, including Wales and Scotland. By comparing the sales income from all of their stores, they were able to collate data that highlighted which areas were the most profitable and receptive to their business. They discovered that by closing the less profitable stations in the south of Scotland, they could increase the income from their other more profitable stations. This example demonstrates the importance of constantly monitoring and maintaining a clear view of the finances of the company. Once the expertise required to run the company had exceeded the abilities of the family, they needed to hire professional consultants. After assessing the company's financial statements, the consultants advised that Telsa close the head office of the convenience stores in Oxford. They deemed the head office unnecessary, and identified it as a financial drain on the company, as the premises were expensive to run and generated no income. In order to avoid firing any employees, they transferred over two hundred staff to other offices. And retrained them to carry out their new roles. 
Now that Telsa had conquered the petrol market in the UK, they were able to branch out into other niche areas that offered prospects for profits. They realized that they could establish a new environmentally friendly brand image by selling fresh food in their convenience stores that had been grown by local farmers. This strategy would not only broaden the scope of the company, but also help to strengthen its relationships with local communities. Every year, Telsa holds a meeting in London, where all of the consultants and managers meet to discuss future plans for development and improvement. These meetings are essential to the evolution of the company, as feedback is heard from all levels of the organization, from the sales staff to the CEOs. They did this by assigning every manager the task of holding staff discussions, at which ideas and concerns would be passed on for evaluation at the meeting. Tesla decided to accommodate the individuality of each of their stores instead of forcing them to conform to one overriding company identity. They realized that by increasing the flexibility of the profit-making strategies of each of the retail stores, they subsequently became more commercially successful. The level of staff satisfaction also increased as a result as the individuals felt that they were not being constrained to one way of thinking. To avoid misunderstandings and mistakes, any future changes were introduced in stages in order to familiarize the staff with the new regulations. Now it's time to conclude the lecture for today. So I will leave you with some food for thought before you leave. In order to run a successful business, one cannot underestimate the importance of maintaining an open mind when deciding on strategies for expansion. Sometimes it's necessary to employ an independent consultant who can offer an objective and unbiased view on the running of your company. Emotion will only ever cloud your ability to make business-related decisions. Research suitable case studies and look at how department stores, for example, were able to alter their organizational structure whilst minimizing costs and staff redundancies. Precedents are an essential resource when it comes to making decisions for your own business, so don't undervalue them. Well, that wraps up our lecture for today. If there are any questions... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.